about getting back to what worship is really about and I feel like this message is so important especially for me and like I feel like the people up here because like this is just what we do you know you just go to practice you learn the songs you come here you sing them but like worship is so important and I feel like even as a church like we just need to have a reverent attitude towards this time like we are worshiping our father our creator and I feel like sometimes we kind of get in the just go to the, with the motions like you stand there and like watch everybody else like sing and do all this stuff but I want us as we sing this song to really like think about what worship is and how we can do that for our Lord this morning. When the music fades and all the 
fellowship in your presence, Lord. I pray that as we give our tithes and our offerings, God, that we would just really think about how amazing of a God you are, Lord. I pray that our hearts would be filled with gratitude, and I pray that it would not only just be filled with gratitude while we're here, Lord Jesus, I pray that it walks with us throughout the rest of our week, Lord Jesus. In your name I pray.
that our prayer. Oh Lord, we want to be a well-received offering, holy and acceptable to you, living sacrifice. Everything that we have has come from you, Lord. 
You are our provider. You're the baker of our bread. Oh, shape us and mold us. Oh, crush the things that need to be crushed. Renew our hearts. Renew our spirits, oh God. Help us to live and operate in the joy of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 4. We're going to wrap up our verse-by-verse -verse series this morning, Joy in Jesus. We're going to read the last 13 verses of this beautiful letter. Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 10. The word of the Lord says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that once again you renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me but lacked the opportunity to show it. And I don't say this out of need for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know both how to have a little and I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances I have learned the secret of being content, whether well fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, you did well by sharing with me in my hardship. And you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts for my needs several times. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. But I have received everything in full, and I have an abundance. I am fully supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you provided, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Those brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those from Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace. And I, I pray that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ will be with every spirit that is here today, Lord, in all of us. Lord, in that intangible part that you created to inhabit, I pray that your grace will permeate, and Lord, that we will all be fully supplied, that we will leave here full of the joy of the Lord, full of the anointing of God, full of the Holy Ghost, full, oh God, of joy, so that we can take on and encounter anything that life throws our way. Lord, that we will learn the secret to contentment the secret to being content in every circumstances is being secure in Jesus oh Lord teach us something today teach us oh Lord that it's not just about giving it's about giving and receiving teach us oh Lord something about celebration teach us oh Lord something about contentment and Lord give us the confidence Lord I pray for every person watching every person listening every person present that they will all move through that progression where we start with I rejoiced and then we move to I can do all things through Christ and then we arrive at my God will surely supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So Lord, I thank you that our source is an endless supply. I pray, oh Lord, that we will not be content spiritually that we'll have a hunger and thirst for righteousness. But Lord, in every circumstance, help us to be content by being secure. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. I just want to say how much I appreciate this worship team, how much I appreciate Rich and Cheryl, how much I appreciate Brother Stephen back there on the video and his team doing that. Praise the Lord. We are finishing up the book of Philippians. Now, hopefully... Now that we have arrived here at the end of this small letter, I hope that you have, a, have an utmost certainty and confidence that you can have joy in Jesus. Praise the Lord. No matter what our circumstances are, no matter where you find yourself this morning, regardless of what others have done, what others will do, or what others are going to do tomorrow, or what they're currently doing, you can still have 
joy in Jesus. If you keep your eyes, amen, on the prize, we have to keep our eyes on that heavenly call. We should seek, as we learned last week, to really help. We should, we should be learning how to rejoice in the Lord, and we should remember all that we have learned. Why? So that we can put it into practice. Praise God. Now Paul is going to wrap up the letter. And usually when you read the New Testament and you come to the end of one of the epistles, you have a list, right? A long list of names that Pastor Dave cannot pronounce, okay? And we laugh about that. This is one of the few where instead of listing out any individual, what he does is he just lists the whole church. He says, to all the saints, to all the Philippians, to every brother and sister who are there, all the saints greet you. So there is this idea where he is appreciative for the whole fellowship that was located at Philippi because every single one of them sought out every opportunity to support the gospel from the beginning of his ministry until the present moment. And since we have just finished with Thanksgiving, and I hope yours was great, mine was really, really good. I ate so much, and I was so thankful for every bite, for every ladle of gravy, for every serving of cranberry sauce. I was thankful for the pumpkin pie and the apple pie, come on, and the pecan pie and the banana pudding, come on, somebody. I mean, I was thankful for all of it, praise God. And I didn't listen to the Holy Spirit like Pastor DJ told us last week. I ignored the warning sign, and I had three or four pieces anyway. Even though I knew God was saying, you know, you can have another piece tomorrow. Ease up a little bit. As we head into, as we head into Christmas, the Christmas season, all of us here at Antioch, the staff at Antioch, we want to say thank you to each and every member of Antioch Baptist Church. We want to have church member appreciation Sunday, and we want to thank every member that we could think of that hasn't already been thanked this year. Thank you to all of you who have helped us love, connect, go, and grow this year. We could not do what we do without your service. And I love the fact, yeah, I love the fact that every, I can say this, every single person that we are going to honor today is a person that does not want to be honored. And I think that's all the more reason to thank them. Because you do the right thing and you serve the Lord because you want to, not because you need to. Praise the Lord. These aren't the squeaky wheels. These are the faithful few, and we want to say that this morning. Uh, before we get to that, though, I, uh, Paul ends this short, this short letter by giving us three essentials for true joy in Jesus. And I think the Lord has put this word on my heart. I, I hope that you can take this and you can receive it, and, th and that you won't just write these things down, meditate on them, pray on them, and see if you can find them. All the places in the Bible, I found these three essentials all throughout, from Genesis to Revelation over and over and over again. If you want to have true joy in Jesus, does anybody want that? Yeah, okay. So I think we're I think we're all in tune here. You need three things: celebration, contentment, and confidence. Let's start with celebration. I love in verse 10 because once again Paul says, and remember where he is now, Roman prison, locked up on a type of house arrest, chained to a centurion. What does he say? I rejoiced in the Lord greatly once again. This was the, the theme. He celebrated. He knew how to celebrate in the Lord. And as I'm reading through the scriptures and I'm, I'm reading through the Psalms and I'm reading through the Old Testament and preparing for to preach through the whole Bible next year, which is what we're going to strive to do. We're going to try to cover the, all the mac macro themes from Genesis to Revelation. I, I see celebration is an essential corporate discipline for the people of God. God wants his people to celebrate. He told the Israelites to set up feasts and festivals. Why? To celebrate the faithfulness and the goodness of God. We need to take time regularly to celebrate in our lives. And it's built into us, right? We celebrate the holidays. You celebrate your birthday. Now, some of you not as much. As you get, as you have more of them, you're not as excited. But I mean, we, when you're when you're 10 years old, your birthday is like the second greatest day of the year. Because everybody is celebrating your birthday. We, we celebrate anniversaries, praise God. And some of you, the, long, the more you have, the less you, I'm just kidding. You should celebrate them more, the more you have. You should say, woo, okay. But we celebrate victories all the time. We even prepare, we celebrate before a victory. Why? We have pep rallies before the football game, right? And then they throw parades after the Super Bowl. It's clear to me, God has built us to celebrate. And Paul knew the best way to keep his eyes on the prize, the best way to maintain joy in Jesus was to rejoice in the Lord greatly. Once again, when we celebrate God's people and when we celebrate God's faithfulness, I want you to understand something. We honor God. We honor him. We exalt him. 
We acknowledge his correct position as high above the earth. And, and here's the thing I found as I, as I meditated on this. Did you know celebration is the opposite of complaining? Isn't it? Yeah? I love how quiet it gets. Now let me ask you a question, and you, you don't have to answer this out loud. Which one of these do you do more? You celebrate more, or do you complain more? The truth is, is we have so much to celebrate. We just finished Thanksgiving. We're heading into Christmas. Let's take time to celebrate all that God has done in our lives. And Paul was celebrating God's people. This, this Philippian church that had faithfully given, they flourished in, in generosity. Man, what a great model for us here at Antioch. This is a church that grew in their giving as the church grew. And as the church matured, they grew in their giving and in their receiving. I think a lot of us have a hesitation about giving because we don't know as much about the receiving. See, it's two sides of the same coin. Give, and it will. What does the Bible say? Your Bible says, give, and it will what? Come back. Give, and it will be given unto you. It is this giving and receiving. It is this exchange with God where we bless him and we say, God, you have provided everything that I have and all that I need and I'm giving it to you. And you know what he does because he's a loving and generous heavenly father is he pours his blessing back out on your life. The Philippian church flourished in generosity. They gave consistently, Paul says, uh, through the middle parts of these verses that from the early days of the gospel until now, they gave sacrificially when no one else did, when no one else would. When Paul was in Thessalonica, he had no other support but from this church. And all I can say is, Antioch, let's be a generous church. Generous giving celebrates in faith. Generous giving, see, when you give in faith and when you give sacrificially, you are giving in anticipation of a blessing. You, uh, that one went right over our heads. When you give sacrificially, you are giving in anticipation of of a blessing you're giving in faith. You say, look, I don't know how my finances will add up if I try to honor God and tithe, but his word says that if I don't tithe, I'm robbing him. I certainly don't want to rob God, so I will return to him what is his, and I will have faith, and I will adjust the rest of my life so that I can seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. That's what your Bible says. That's what our Bibles tell us to do. We need to be like that, and we give because we know God is faithful because we know that if God can feed 5,000 plus people with five loaves of bread and with two fish, it doesn't matter what the price tag on this building is. As we are faithful to give, God will be faithful to bring in everything that we need to accomplish his will. Today, we want to celebrate some of God's faithful people. And at the end of service, after the invitation, we're going to list off several couples and we're going to celebrate uh, several individuals for their faithfulness to God. And this is why, two reasons. And this is what the Lord just impressed upon me so strongly. Heaven honors faithfulness and God rewards faithfulness. I encourage you to go back through your Bible and read about every single scene of heaven. One of the things that you will find is every heavenly creature is constantly honoring the faithfulness of God the holiness and the uniqueness of God. All the angels cry and the 24 elders cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And they can't say anything else, not because there isn't more to say, but it's all that they can say because they are so captivated by God's holiness and by his faithfulness. Heaven honors faithfulness and God rewards faithfulness. Every faithful servant of God will hear one thing at the end of their life, well done good and faithful servant. So if that is the, if that's the culture of heaven, that should be the culture of Antioch. And we got to build it in. We've got to, we've got to work towards that end. We should, if we're going to continue to pray, Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, then our culture is going to have to match heaven's culture. But too often the church ends up mir mirroring the world's culture. And that's why it gets so diluted and people will continue to say, well, I don't want to go there because it's full of a bunch of hypocrites. What if they said, man, I've never met a group of more honoring and faithful people in all my life. Let's flip the script. Let's change the narrative and let's match the culture of heaven. And just remember, if your name doesn't get called this morning, I would kindly remind you what Pastor Carter told you last Sunday. You go and you see him. Praise the Lord. He said that and I didn't tell him to say that. He said it. He will make sure that you get on the list for next year. Because this is something that we want to regularly do and we want to regularly celebrate. But maybe you're in a season in your life right now 
I'm talking about celebration, and you're like, well, Pastor Dave, I really don't have a lot to celebrate right now. This season for me, I'm actually dreading the holidays because as I go into the holidays, all I can think about is the loved ones that aren't here anymore, the loved ones who have passed on, the relationships that are rough or rocky, or maybe you just struggle extra hard with depression during this time of the year. So many people go through that seasonal depression and they don't, they don't have any, there's no explanation for it. It's just like the, the leaves and everything around them starts to die and then they feel it coming on them like a heavy burden. I want to remind us, when you don't have anything else in your life that you can point to to celebrate, remember this, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Come on, when you don't have anything else to celebrate, you know what we do? We celebrate our salvation. We celebrate the mercy and the grace and the goodness of God. We celebrate our salvation, and you should because it is nearer now than when you first believed. And that's reason to celebrate. Amen. The second essential I see in these verses is contentment. Contentment. Paul had learned to be content in every circumstance. See, he says he learned to be content whether he was hungry or well-fed. Now, I have not learned that. I'm telling you right now. I have not learned to be content when I am not well-fed. I get hangry, okay? I turn into another person, a different being, when I am hungry. I'm trying. I want to learn. But the only way to learn is to fast. And I don't like to do that because I'm like, all I can think about when I'm fasting is how much I want to eat. But I'm working in it. Paul learned it. He says, in every circumstance, whether I have an abundance or whether I have a need, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. One Greek philosopher was asked this question, who is the wealthiest man in the world? And this was the response. He who is content with the least. The wealthiest person is the person who is content with the least. I love how Dr. Tony Evans describes contentment. He says this, contentment is being just as happy driving a brand new Mercedes as you would be driving that hoopty you had in college. In both cases, you have arrived. You had a you have a ride. Contentment is taking as much pleasure in that big $500,000 house as you would in a two-bedroom apartment. In both cases, you have a roof over your head. Contentment is appreciating a T-bone steak as much as you would a, a, a gas station hot dog. In both cases, you're not starving. Contentment is being just as satisfied with a designer outfit as you would be with a hand-me-down outfit. In both cases, you have clothes on your back and you're not naked. Contentment is realizing that God has met your every single need. That's contentment. To be content is to be satisfied with Christ alone. Christ has to be enough. Now, I want you to notice something in, in chapter 3 and chapter 4. It, Paul was, was content, but he was not complacent. This is so important. He was content, but he was not complacent. He was at peace in every single earthly circumstance, but he relentlessly pursued Jesus. He kept his eyes on the prize, and he was not satisfied. He would not be satisfied until heaven was truly his home forever. And I think so many in the church today are opposite. And I think that's the problem with the spiritual climate that we have. We have very little interest in spiritual growth, but we check our Robin Hood app 20 times a day to see if we've made a dollar in the stock market. We relentlessly try to keep up with the people around us, and we rarely think to check in and see, are we walking with the Holy Spirit? We worry and we fear the worst, and we're anxious about everything because we go to Facebook and we neglect God's book. We'll check Instagram a hundred times a day and forget that because of what Christ did on the cross, you have instant access to the throne room of heaven. Anytime you ask, he will answer and he will receive you. Lord, help us to be more like you. Lord, help us to be more like Paul. Bring us to a place of repentance. See, Paul was content with any worldly position, but he pressed on towards Christ. He still had a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. I think many people today in our culture fail to realize, and many people in the church, they can never be content because they are too spiritually complacent. It's impossible. It is impossible. So, here, in, other, in other words, you, you could say it like this. This is probably easier to remember. When Christ isn't enough, nothing else will ever be enough. When Christ isn't enough, nothing else will ever be enough. Praise the Lord. Many of us, I, I feel, and even me in a lot of ways, 
we still have trouble putting our eyes on the wrong prize. We're never content no matter what we drive, no matter what house we have, no matter what shoes we wear or what iPhone we're playing on or what water bottle we tote around or what shotgun we're hunting with. So many of us, and it's so quiet on that one, praise you. So many of us in today's culture, we haven't learned how to do without. We can't say what Paul says, and I think we haven't learned to do without because so many of us have lived for so long with so much excess. See, unless you have to, unless you suffer loss, it's really impossible to learn how to be content. You know, God provided Paul. He learned how to be content because when he was hungry, his food was obedience to God, and the Lord fed him. It's like Elijah when he's out in the desert, and there's nobody else around him. What does God do? God sends a raven to make him a meal, to bring him a meal. Before Uber Eats and DoorDash, God sent a raven out into the desert. See, I mean, until you, until you have to live without, it's really hard for you to learn to appreciate what you really have. And when Paul was full, when he did have an abundance, what did he do with it? He didn't hoard it. He shared and he gave to others and he sowed into the kingdom and he planted other churches and he, he went further with the gospel. I mean, when he did receive, he gave it away to be a blessing to others. It reminds me of an old saying that goes like this. You'll never realize that Jesus is enough until Jesus is all you really have. You'll never realize it. Lord, teach us. Many of us need to learn what Paul taught Timothy, who was his spiritual son and his disciple, Godliness with what? Contentment is great gain. Lord, teach us that lesson. I, I see a progression here. When you learn to rejoice greatly in the Lord and to celebrate the faithfulness of God, then you will be able to sing that old song without lying. Because a lot of us, we sing through the songs, but we don't really mean them in our heart. But you remember that old song, I have decided to follow Jesus, the cross before me, the world behind me, there's an old chorus that says, you can take my world, but just give me Jesus. Lord, make that the cry of our heart. Then, hey, once you learn contentment, post Philippians 4.13 all over your Facebook page. Then you can post. So you have to learn it. You cannot learn it, though, until you live it. You have to live it in order to learn it. But once you're living it, once you've experienced it, then you'll know I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Because I thought I was at my breaking point. I thought I couldn't go any further. I was just about to give up. But when I called on the name of Jesus, he sent his spirit to quicken me. He sent his power to anoint me. And as I waited upon the Lord, I began to feel my strength renewed. And I soared like the eagles through the circumstance and through the hospital surgery, and through the doctor's visit, and through the awkward phone call, and all of those things, I learned I can do all things. And I'm telling you right now, Pastor Dave has been living this verse. I've had a baby, a toddler, and my in-laws in my house for five days. I know what it means. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Praise the Lord. And the truth is, we've actually done so much celebrating. And as we sat around, and you know, my parents and Laura's parents, and we all had Thanksgiving together with our new additions, and my aunt and her grandmother, man, oh, man, what a blessing to have such a godly heritage. What a blessing to have two set my kids, to have two sets of grandparents that are still married and that still love the Lord and that are following Jesus. What a blessing to have a loving home to bring children into. What a blessing to have a full refrigerator. What a blessing to have so many extra hands around to do the little things. And what a blessing to have a church family that steps up and donates strollers and car seats and diapers and clothes and all of those things. I mean, as you learn, as you walk, as you grow, you learn to celebrate. And the more you learn to celebrate the goodness and the faithfulness of God, the more content you are in every earthly situation. The two feed each other. You learn contentment by learning to celebrate the little things, by rejoicing in the Lord through the big trials and through the hardest things and trusting God in the face of every fear and danger and toil and snare. And when you learn, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, you begin to live with confidence. And it's so important, not confidence in yourself, but a confidence in the Lord, an unwavering unshakable confidence in the power and provision of Almighty God. Man, I love this progression in, in verses 10 through 19. Because Paul starts off saying, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord. That's where he starts. 
So when you're at the bottom, when you're in the pit, when you're in the trial, when you're facing hardship, what do you, how do you respond? You say, I rejoice greatly in the Lord again. And then he continues on as he is rejoicing and celebrating. He continues on with, wow, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And after he walks through that trial and after he is celebrating through that trial and as he's learning to be content in the Lord, what does he end with? I know this, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Why? Because I know if he did it for me, he will most certainly do it for you. And if he did it once, then I know without a shadow of a doubt that he will do it again. It starts off, I rejoice. Then it goes to, I can. And it ends with, my God will. And that's the progression in having the joy of Jesus in our everyday life. Oh, come on, somebody. I rejoiced. I can. And my God will. Now, the devil wants to convince you to start with, I relapsed, so that you will continue with, I can't. And you will come to the conclusion that God won't. And some of you have been playing that old song on repeat for long enough. You've watched that rerun long enough. You gotta, if you wanna, come on, if you wanna, you gotta start it right if you wanna end it right. Come on, somebody. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord. My boss was a jerk. My kids trashed the room that I just cleaned up. My body is failing. My loved ones are gone. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, and he renewed my strength. He picked me up, and he turned me around, and he placed my feet on solid ground. And now I know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And now that I'm fully supplied, Paul said, I am fully supplied. I have no lack. I have no need. I'm full of the Holy Spirit. I'm full of the joy of the Lord. I can look at you when you're down, and I can look at you when you're doubting, and I can look at you when you're in the valley of death and when you're suffering with grief and I can say with an unshakable confidence my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory Woo! my God will supply Ooh, I'm going to need a hanky if you keep preaching like that huh? my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And here's what here's what hit me right between the eyes. Like, boom, like just right, just struck me. And the Holy Spirit just put it right in my heart. The supply is only as good as the storehouse. I was shopping at Walmart the other day. And if you go to Walmart right now, I mean, first of all, take some pictures. Because there are some wild sights out there. You're walking around going, these people are walking around like this. It makes you feel great about yourself too, by the way. You're struggling with self-esteem? Go to Walmart. You're going to find a bunch of people. That, if she can wear that out in public, I can, I can be okay. Praise the Lord. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Hallelujah. And here's the thing. You go to a worker now. See, when you go to the grocery store, back in the day, some of y'all are too young to remember this, but what used to be when you went to the store, number one, you would have somebody who knew where the item that you were looking for was. And that's what used to happen. You would go into a store and you would say, I'm looking for... A, a, a drill set, a drill bit set. And they would go, okay, right, right down this way. That doesn't happen anymore. When you go in the Walmart, you know what they tell you? They say, I don't really know. Look at the app. That's what they tell you. And I'm looking at the app and I'm going, your app says it's on, it's on A16, which by the way, it, it makes no, the way you got set up the alphabet makes no sense. You got A and E and Q like in a line. And it, so it says right here, it's, it's an A16 that it's in stock. And she says, oh, we haven't had that for weeks. Well, you see, the supply is only as good as the storehouse. Now, the world can supply happiness for a little while. The Bible says that sin is good for a season, but it's in short supply because the storehouse is circumstances and possessions. Come on, somebody. My, my God says that his storehouse is his glory. Paul says this, my God will supply all your needs. And this is where he's pulling the supply from. According to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It's according to the unfathomable wisdom of God. His splendor, his mercy, his love, and his grace. Psalm 3119 says he has stored up goodness for those who fear the Lord. There is no lack in God's storehouse. His word says in Ephesians chapter 3 that he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can even ask or think. Come on, somebody. Since there's no lack in God's glory, there can be no lack in God's provision. The storehouse this morning is full. Taste and see 
that the Lord is good. Now, I don't know some of y'all. If y'all can't praise him after that, I just got nothing else for you. <laughs> nothing. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns the hills that the cattle are on. What are you worried about? Why are you worried that there will never be enough when, in fact, he will be more than enough? And as you learn to celebrate God's faithfulness and the faithfulness of God's people, we will learn to be content. And we will live, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Then we will have the confidence to encourage and bless others. And we can tell them, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And I know he'll do it for you because he's done it for me. And what's the result? It all comes full circle in verse 20. More celebration. We will all say to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. Amen. God wants to give us joy in Jesus. Where are you struggling with in the progression this morning? Just ask yourself. Just think and, and ask the Lord to reveal it to you. Some of us are, or maybe you're struggling with rejoicing in the Lord greatly again. But there was a time, you know, you remember when you were on the top of the mountain and everybody was asking you, how's it going? You're like, oh, it's going great. It's so good. God's so faithful. Everything is looking up, right? But then when you came down and you got into the valley, maybe you're having trouble rejoicing in the Lord. Maybe you're doubting that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Or maybe you're doubting that God will truly supply all your needs. You're like, well, I feel like I've been needy for a long time. Well, you gotta go to the right source to receive the right supply. The real secret in having that joy in Jesus that Paul talked about is relying on him. And I thought about a story I read maybe 10 years ago. And it was crazy because there was this story of an airplane that actually took off and flew without a pilot. The pilot, they had emptied out the plane and when they took the emergency brake off, the braking system off, the plane was still in gear. And so the plane actually went down the runway and it took off and it flew without anybody on it. And it went 90 miles before it crashed. Now in a plane, 90 miles, is, that's not very far. But it went 90 miles and then it crashed. And what, what the Lord spoke to my heart is, listen, without God in your life, you can take off for a while, can't you? You may, you may be able to get down that runway. You may be able, you're even going to take it off. You may be able to think, you know what, it's going pretty daggone good all on my own. But without Jesus... As your pilot, it's only a matter of time before the plane crashes. Without God, you may be able to get your own name in lights for a while. You might be able to build something that looks great in the eyes of the world for a while. But there is coming a time when you're going to run out of fuel. And without Jesus, after when you run out of fuel, the plane's only going in one direction. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want to invite you to respond to this invitation. We want to start a celebration in heaven because the Bible says that when one sinner repents, all of heaven rejoices. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Dave, look, I'm doubting God's ability to get me through this. I, I, I'm not content. For whatever reason, I have no satisfaction in my life. You need to come to the cross and be filled with Christ. If you're having trouble believing and trusting in the faithfulness of God, let some of us pray with you and remind you that he will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. I'm going to pray. When I say amen, we're going to stand. And if you need to come to the cross this morning, I invite you to come. Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you. Lord, I pray for those who are here and struggling with contentment. I pray, Lord, for those who are here and they don't know you as Lord and Savior. I pray, Lord, for those who are here and they need a fresh touch from you. I just pray, Lord, that you will fill this place and fill our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Let's stand and sing. Respond to the word of the Lord.
members from Antioch Baptist Church. I'm going to ask Bruce to come. Jess, if you'll come. I'm going to run through this list. And as you hear your name, if you would, just come to the front and get your gift. Ladies only, get the roses. Guys, I'm sorry. If you want a flower, let me know. I'll pick one for you, okay? Individuals, get the cards. On this side, couples get the cards on Bruce's side. All right. Well, the first couple is Bruce and Lauren Ward. Bless you, brother. 
And thank God for your wife. Man, we pray for her daily. Praise God. Miss June Allen, Judy and Hans Carter, Miss Allison Pace, Denise and Greg Vogt, Pete and Jerry Jensen, Teresa Johnson, our awesome treasurer, Missy and Troy Tapscott, Calvin and Teresa Johnson with the new building committee, Angela and Frankie Bishop, Jess and Dewey Partouche, Kim Draper, Lyle, Laura Lynn McCauley and Wyatt Tapscott, Tommy and Paula Aldridge, Matt and Ivy Frazier, Rich and Cheryl Gibson, Stephen Allen and Rose Bunch, Raymond and Kristen Bunch, Mike and Jessica Farmer and John Farmer, David, David and Melissa McLean, Scott and Susie Wright, Aaron and Damie McCauley, Aaron and Wanda Pace, Laney and Brandon Taylor, Zach and Toria Pace, Heather Reed, Fred and Lori Lane, Sam Halpin, Nancy Adams, Trix and Christy Hazlip, Travis and Stacy Rittenhouse, Donna and Linwood Butler, Justin and Michelle Sorrells, Jack and Ruth Whip, Dorothy and Grant Houchins, Gail and David Gentry, Alex Fourier, Kim Gibson, Fern Ward, Ann Kirby, Greg and Susie Lawhorn, Laura Vogt, Jeff Marshall, I forgot his wife's name, I can't, I'm blanking, Nick and Kelsey Algieri, oh my gosh, Mackenzie Marshall and her husband, and your mother, Jacob, come on man, Jeff and Margaret Marshall, Margaret Marshall, I remember, thank you all so much, can we give one big hand clap, thank you so much to every member of Antioch Baptist Church that has given, that has helped us love, connect, and go and grow, God bless you, God bless you and thank you, let's go into the next year, and come on somebody, let's do it again. Let's see the Lord, let's see the Lord reach this community in a new and powerful way. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you, O oh Lord, that we can have joy in Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you will fill us up with that joy. And Lord, help us teach us, O oh God, to really celebrate your faithfulness and your faithful people. Lord, help us to continue to learn to be content. And Lord, give us that unwavering, unshakable confidence and remind us that you will supply all our needs according to your riches and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. Go in the peace and joy of the Lord.